Coming up next, the last talk for tonight. Please welcome on stage Tomás Varga from Szállás.hu. And thank you for the introduction. My name is Tomás Varga. I've been with Szállás.hu for seven years now, where I started leading international expansion, and I'm currently responsible for development and our experience and experience tourism department. My presentation will be a nice opposition to the first one today because I just love theories and applying them to practice, so I do think that there's some beauty in finding a theory and, and actually trying to apply it to practice, and that's what I did with today's presentation as well. In the hope that I will be able to show you some some learnings from our growth story at the company, and also that you may be able to use some of these learnings for understanding the company's growth that you are representing, or maybe planning the future growth of the companies that you are representing. Before I jump into that, I will just briefly introduce what Salash.hu actually is. We are what the travel industry calls an online travel agency, which means well, we basically enable hotels to appear on our platform, and we also enable customers to book those hotels. Our revenue source is commission-based, so we only ask hotels for successfully mediated bookings, which means that we do have some significant marketing risk because we do have to acquire customers from the internet. We have to make them actually book a hotel by giving them a great customer experience, and well, the KPI that represents our ability to do this is called the conversion rate. The conversion rate is a pretty significant KPI for us, and I'm going to talk about it later, because it directly impacts our profitability. So if, let's say, from 100 visitors come to our website and one leaves by making a booking, that's half as many visitors as if two leaves make a booking. And the way we can design the website, the platform, and also provide the overall product experience has a huge impact on our profitability. Then, once we hopefully manage to give a good enough experience that the customer books with us, then we have to provide some retention experience as well, so that this customer does return to Salash.hu to make a next and next booking. I will talk about it later that the journey that leads to this is by providing good travel experience before hotel booking and also after hotel booking as we move further in time. So very briefly, this is how Salash.hu operates. Depending on the product and the market, there are some variations in this, but for general understanding, this is what we do. In economics, this is called a two-sided network or a two-sided platform. Um, this Harvard Business Review article describes some aspects of operating such a platform. And one very important is that we have basically networks on both sides of our operation. What does this mean? We have a lot of hotels and we have a lot of customers. It also means that there are positive and strong network effects on both sides of this network. This means that the more hotels there are, the more customers are happy, and the more customers there are, the more hotels are happy. Well, this seems trivial, but what's not so trivial is that there's a really fine balance between finding the right amount of hotels and the right amount of customers at any given time during our growth. Why? Because if we have too many hotels, but not enough customers, then some hotels will start to be dissatisfied with our service. If we can send them enough customers, they will not recommend our service to other hotels. And similarly, if we have too many customers, but not enough hotels, then customers will start to be dissatisfied with our service. This is what's called a positive and strong network effect, and also maintaining a balance between how we can grow the two sides of the network, basically at the same time simultaneously, so that both sides actually remain satisfied. This is one theoretical framework that I will go into apply throughout the presentation, and the next one is a set of questions by Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is uh, one of the earliest investors of Facebook and both PayPal. And in his book that I had the chance to read just three weeks ago, Zero to One, he describes a set of questions that basically any business, any startup can ask before actually starting at the venture to start a startup. Well, the first one is uh, whether you can actually create a breakthrough technology, one that is 10 times at least better than the existing alternatives. 
then there is whether this is the right time to start your business, if you have the team that, uh, that you actually are going to deliver with, whether you are entering a, a big enough segment but small enough so that you can start to generate profitability and basis for further growth, also a marketing and a sales plan, whether your position will be defendable, and, uh, and whether you have any opportunity that maybe no one else sees on execution. Throughout the presentation, I will try to answer these questions and, uh, and highlight why our company could grow, where maybe others couldn't, and maybe help you also think about it in the future when you are thinking about your business. Let's start with the launch as the first stage of development. The company was founded in 2007, which, well, I earlier read most of these stories about American companies, these garish type of companies, but that kind of applies to Salash.2. You can see in the, the upper right corner the two gentlemen who originally started the company in a Mishkoltz University dorm room by starting to code the website. They then started recruiting people uh, also during the university, and, and they were pretty enthusiastic about starting the business itself, of course. The way Salash.2 started was by launching Mishkol Salash.2, which was a regional website, and 19 other variations of it for the biggest regional destinations in Hungary. Where I'm going to answer the first question proposed by uh, uh, Peter Thiel, whether you, whether you have a small enough segment that you can start to start to be a winner in. Probably at that time, Mishkoltz and the 90 regional websites was a good idea to start with because it was big enough to be important, but small enough to actually be able to focus on and scale both sides of the network at the same time. So bring on board hotels and bring on board customers as well. What enabled also this is that marketing also started pretty early. So the first radio spots went on air quite early, 2009. You can see an example of, a, of an outdoor banner, which we deployed in partnership with hotels in Hungary. And, uh, and uh, basically, already marketing and sales started quite early, and we, and we managed to grow, start growing both sides of the network at the same time. I added some revenue figures here. You can see that it started picking up quite nicely, and you can see the original versions uh, of the platforms as well, how, uh, how we looked in these early starting years. There are a few attributes that I would also like to highlight. So this is a bigger screenshot of the 2011 version of Salash.2. And these attributes are in Hungarian, but in English they mean package offers, program, wellness, and um, also Hungarian disc uh, local travel incentive card redeeming option. This was the Udulesi check at that time which are basically local important features for Hungarian travelers. So it was, I think, the seventh question on Peter Thiel's set of questions, whether you see any local opportunity that maybe others don't or don't execute on. Well, I believe that these local features for the Hungarian market was something that were not available probably at the international com uh, competition already at the beginning uh, of our company. Also, for hotels, this was a time when uh, when this type of transaction-based model was still not very widespread. So most of, the, most of the websites at this time usually asked for a listing fee, a fixed upfront fee. So the way that they could actually manage reservations, basically monetarily risk-free, since they only had to pay for, for successful bookings, was something new. So not just for customers, but for hotels, this was a relatively new, uh, relatively new thing, uh, which was introduced quite early. All this happened right after the financial crisis, or actually in the middle of it. So you can see some stats about the evolution of Hungarian tourism during the first um, well, years of growth. What's pretty easy to spot that this was not the brightest years at that time, as generally. But what it did create was, let's say, an opportunity because hotels did need a cost-effective channel for marketing, which was potentially risk-free. And also, customers need a transparent, good website and a service for comparing um, uh, prices, offers, and making actually the best selection for their budgets. And afterwards, when things started picking up, a lot of also, well, money went into infrastructure building in Hungary, to wellness services, and so on. Um, once again, the domestic travel incentives were, uh, were increased. Things started quite of picking up 
for, for, for Tourism as well and Sallash.hu as well. So I will just move on to the next stage soon, which, which will already be a pretty nice stage of growth. I did ask some of the founding members of the team when I joined the company, like what they think, how it was at these tiers, you know. Peter Drucker has this saying, culture is strategy for breakfast, so that's usually not included in the stories, but I, I did bring some examples, and it was like going to, to an interview in a dorm room and working until two at night, falling asleep, continuing in the, in the morning, having a stri strong drive for excellence and professional knowledge learning. So basically, we want to understand the culture of the company. It was something like learning, professional approach, fast moving, and, and also kind of humanly approach. By humanly approach, I also mean that when I joined the company, then the founders came directly to the train station when I arrived to Mishkos to take me to the office. Also, I slept at their place, uh, actually, when I visited the Mishkos office and, and so on, which was a change in experience because I also worked at a bigger, bigger company before. So, so it was something to understand about the startup culture. So to answer, let's say, the first four questions, which I think that we can give an affirmative to, to Peter, this question is, uh, yeah, it was probably the right time to start. We were, it was a good enough segment, definitely had the right team and the unique opportunity with some local touches for the Hungarian market, probably. Growth driven by marketing is what I call the second stage of our development. In 2011, Sanoma Budapest acquired 50% of the company, which was at that time Hungary's second biggest media company, and well, maybe um, because of the mindset, well, maybe because of the media portfolio as well, a lot of marketing went into actually promoting the product in Hungary this year. So TV campaign, super brands, YouTube uh, partnership, affiliate program, a lot of stuff launched, baby photo competitions that you can see here. We were quite good on Facebook as well. And I actually brought you two examples to give an idea that this was really creative marketing that we tried to do and also some risk-taking marketing. If I may ask the presenters now to start the first video, please. Hopefully everyone is very curious by now. Soon. Well, the audio adds to the buzz now, I would say. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to just explain that what you will see is a video based on a word joke in Hungarian. Being within spitting distance means that something is very close to you. So the first video is going to hopefully, uh, well, add the narration to this. And then, as you can see, it was kind of a little bit shocking TV advertisement, which was running on national TV. So afterwards, we ran a second advertisement where our CEO was directly taking punishment for this campaign. Azt írták, hogy egy köpésre a víztől. Foglalj valós adatok alapján. Legközelebb szállás.hu. Yeah, so this was the first video, and now here comes the follow-up punishment of our CEO who was publicly voted what he should do because he allowed this campaign to go on air. It was actually an online campaign where people had free opportunities select, to select from, and we allowed them, we promoted it on Facebook also, I believe, and then the punishment that took the highest number of votes was what he had to carry it out. And he, well, we made our 10 years uh, history video, he still explained that it was one of his high points during his career with the company, because as you will see, he was jumping in a unicorn uh, mascot on the Balaton, on the beach, in front of some real people, most likely. <laughs> in half a minute. <clears throat> okay, so in the meantime, I'm going to still explain that um, 
the this. Now let's see the video. No, this is not. Even. Yeah, this was the next year's not so successful video anyway. But I think let's keep it for now. Thank you. So we just continue the presentation. Um, so. You have to imagine that RCO took a pu public punishment for this, which was also national uh, television. And um, the problem with this was that by this time, we had uh, a lot of marketing effort, a lot of creativity and effort gone into marketing, but our product started to, to be a little, uh, a little old. So our brand awareness in Hungary was very, very good, which was cool, because to answer Peter Thiel's question, we did have a sales and marketing strategy. But, uh, but the platform itself started to be a little old because there was not enough focus on developing that. I did mention you about the conversion rate, which is basically the efficiency of our platform and the entire customer experience. That started going down by this time, so which was kind of an alarm clock for us to start actually also moving focus back towards product development. But then before that, similar to the previous presentation, we had some restructuring to do because we crossed 50 people by this time. And this was the, the first time that we really had to start installing management within the company. This is where I also arrived to, for the international expansion part. We had PPC development, so on and so, a new office. And it was a very difficult year, especially the first half. So I do remember some crying at the reports and some discussion whether the reports should be monthly or quarterly, and talking to one executive, the other one saying a different thing, and yeah, stuff like this that comes with growth. But, uh, but basically, we fought through this thanks to also some, some good initiatives that involved some risk taking. This was a commission raise on the market. We were a lot cheaper than our international competition before that time. We managed to, uh, to actually raise that. We had new initiatives like the Hotel of the Year. And also, we could complete basically the new product and the new platform by middle of 2014. As you can imagine, this was kind of a wow moment for, for the company because this is basically what you can see from Salash.2 today, and it, and it meant a 30-40% increase in our profitability instantly, thanks to a conversion rate increase brought by the better customer experience. And then once we had this restructuring and there were teams to actually scale execution within the company, we entered the, what I call the fourth stage, which is the growth driven by core product development upgrades. I'm not going to say all this, just to give you an idea that there are really a lot of projects that we are actually undertaking. Since it made, was made possible by our organizational restructuring and by new leaders as well, and also promoting the old uh, team members to leadership positions and so on and so on. And, uh, and since then, every year we have like four or five important projects to, to actually make the experience better. Mobile redesign, admin introduction, and so on. Just to give you an idea, this was our new admin interface for our partners as well, so not just for the users. But of course, not everything was so rosy. I did promise in the description of the presentation to talk about mistakes as well. Well, we also had some, obviously, during the growth. This is from an internal presentation that we had during 2016 that, well, tells the story of a few projects did not go so very nicely. This was called the desert that, um, well, was a, again an alarm clock that we need to change something because, well, in three years, our number actually doubled again and we were once again missing something from the organization. This was the time, since we have some IT and tech people uh, from, uh, from the audience, as I saw in the last presentation, when we realized that we need project managers within the organization, because it was nice that previously IT and managers and so on were discussing everything directly, but then we needed to have project managers at this time. Actually, at least to name them, and then bi-weekly project reports, and so on and so on. But a very important part, again, as in the last presentation, was to make this like humanly again, and to make it culture fit. What you can see here on the right side is a table that all the project managers we named received, which was a character typical for them, including a sentence that it was designed for you by 100 people who believed that our destiny is our own hands. Uh, so something to give you res responsibility, but also you know, a friendly approach. And actually, it was this colleague who told me that this was something that, that actually moved him to assume responsibility really for projects. On the left side, this is a one-pager project management suggestion, which is, yeah, it's not a complete agile framework. 
but it's something that was good for the organization at that time to actually start thinking about deadlines and, uh, and delivery and so on. And then from, let's say, 2017 18, we entered what we are currently in, what I would call the era of expansion. Um, it was once again a pivotal time for us when Portfolio and OTP acquired 100% together of the company. So 2017, the founders actually left the company. We had role transitions, uh, management establishment, starting next level of leadership. And well, since we are at a leadership conference, I brought some examples of the well, leadership theories and approaches that I've familiarized myself with during the couple of years. I use this personally to, to coach my leaders and the leaders I work with, or at least myself, so that I can identify what should be uh, done in different situations. And this is basically a few approaches from learning leadership fundamentals to learning your, about yourself, individual coaching, partners we work with, about culture, organization development, because I do believe that it's quite important to, to know these because you can make better leadership decisions by them. I don't want to go through with them, but any of you are curious, you can email me or so and I can send you a more comprehensive list. Anyway, to give you an idea that the culture that I I mentioned to you about learning and working and challenging ourselves also applies to leadership and the practices of leadership. I do believe that it's quite important to start learning about it and develop yourself as a leader. Back to the business, what means expansion for us? It means expansion in customer lifecycle. So before hotel booking, after hotel booking, I will show you some new products that we in the meantime introduced. Geographically, we made acquisitions in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Romania. And also vertically, we made acquisitions in Hungary, especially in the deals segment with Sporoi Velem, Nemoraj Land, Majutazás. Of course, in the meantime, we continue to continue our product and so on and so on. And this all resulted that we are now a 300 people company. We basically doubled our, our, our size in, in about two years, which, uh, which is a really nice challenge for us at the moment, but that is where we are currently. Program search, this is how Salash looks for actually not just hotels but programs anymore. This is found under a different URL just to give you an idea. This is our blog for travel inspiration content, our mobile app and our loyalty program which are under launch at the moment. And uh, also these are our foreign uh, websites now which the local teams are developing and developed. Hotel CZ, Spa CZ, Travel Minute for example in Romania. Uh, and the Czech Republic, and also it is my Utah's Ash uh, for the deal sector in Hungary. And here comes the third theoretical approach that I would like to give you some information about, which is called the EPRG model. The EPRG model was first published in 1969, if I'm correct, and it describes how an organization can decide how to like, scale to international level. Ethnocentric means that you take the original country's model and apply it to other countries directly. Polycentric means that you adjust to the target country, so to the host country where you want to expand to. Regional is thinking in region, and world is for the complete world. What we learned during the year, at least in our business, is that ethnocentric, where we just you know, do salash for other countries, has its limitations because we need to adjust to the local markets. So a polycentric approach at the moment seems to work better for us. This is why we also made acquisitions with outstanding local teams. For example, in Romania, could uh, very well adapt to the local market and also in the Czech Republic because, um, as I described, during our Hungarian product differentiation, we do believe and we do experience that being specific to the local country is, is quite important. The good thing about polycentric approach is that it's, um, it's flexible. The bad thing about it is that it's relatively um, expensive and complex in terms of organizational setup. That's also, for example, what we are with development preparing for to handle a lot of localizations and uh, so on, actually deciding on them based on the volume and, uh, and being able to manage this. So this is just to give you an insight what we are currently doing. And to answer the last question of Peter Thiel, if we 
and our position will be defendable 10 or 20 years. With this setup, with our expansion geographically, in the verticals and also in the life cycle, I do believe that now our market position will actually be defendable for the next 10 to 20 years, because in the Central Eastern Europe, with this, uh, with this market, I think it's, it's a strong position that we can achieve and actually compete with the international competition in the long run. Um, there is still time, so basically after I just quickly went through our growth story and tried to well, give a perspective on it uh, based on Peter Till's questions, I did have a last thing, uh, thought to add. And this is again from a Harvard Business Review article. This is, uh, this is what it called the chaos pilot. Maybe I described that we do had a lot of change during these last years. And uh, this, uh, this chaos pilot is not something that exists usually in leadership terms, but it's, it's quite an important mindset when you think of change and how and what people can really manage change, at least as I found it. So a chaos pilot is someone who is comfortable with uncertainty and can actually draw a path in that uncertainty. So what's described here that maybe even entertain the thought of being within uncertainty. This is not trivial, this is not easy. It is basically a set of skills and probably techniques for stress management also, uh, after, uh, after at least a certain amount of uh, uncertainty. But what, what characterizes these uh, chaos pilots is that they are comfortable with it and that they are capable of divergent thinking, convergent action, and also influential communication. When I thought about the past years and what innovations went through, what maybe failed or went a little astray, it was a pretty good approach um, to, to, to try to apply if, uh, if there was really a chaos pilot type of, uh, type of colleague trying to lead that project, if it was really innovative. And I think it's just, just as a last thought, an important addition to, to the leadership dictionary, that when you are going to encounter change, and design leaders to lead that change, then think about these type of at least three or four attributes, how he is going to handle uncertainty and uh, put that into action and actually be able to communicate it throughout the organization. And uh, well, this was from me. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Please leave your hand if you do. Couldn't see anyone. Oh, there is one coming. Hi, my name is Umer. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have a question that uh, my thinking is that Salash was the first website which was doing this kind of uh, business in Hungary. How did you get the data of the hotels, like the developers, okay, they are just engineers, how, even if they wanted to start something, but how did they collect the data of the hotels and all these uh, Salash type things? So if I understood correctly, the question was how we convinced the hotels to join, start joining the platform and uh, to start working with us at the beginning. Well, the enthusiastic core team was, well, going to hotels and started talking to them. Um, the good thing about the model is that hotels don't have risk by joining, didn't have risk, because they didn't have any upfront fees. Basically, the risk that hotels are taking is the effort that they need to put into uploading their data into the Salash extranet. And if they start receiving reservations, what we see is that they are happy to start managing this data, keep their prices up to date, keep their availabilities up to date, and so on. If they don't start receiving reservations, they are not so happy about it. And since from the beginning, we started actually delivering reservations to the hotels, let's say on a weekly basis, who started joining, it started what I believe is a positive spiral so that they actually started managing their data, they, they gave better prices maybe, or better availabilities, or more up-to-date availabilities, and then this all started a positive spiral that more hotels started joining because they heard it was good, they also saw the commercials, so then this is something what I would call a positive spiral 
for all this type of business, the two-sided network. Thank you. There is another question. I'm coming right now. Yeah. Huh? Okay, so before the last question, we're just going to miss the, uh, play the missing video as a, as a final fun. <laughs> Szavaztátok a büntetésen. Végre hajtasz. De ígérjétek, mindig valós vélemények alapján foglaltok. Yeah, so, this was the follow-up campaign on TV. And the question? Hello, hi, my name is Gabor Török, and in fact, I've got two questions. Um, first is that I'm pretty sure that you've made your own SWOT analysis with strengths and weaknesses and other stuff, and probably made a business canvas. Uh, what is your value proposition compared to other similar competitors like Booking.com in Hungary and in the region? Hmm? That was the first question. For Hungary or for the other countries or I mean, generally? For you in general. Hmm? For us, in general, it's being more local, being closer to both hotels and the customers and providing those little things that international competition doesn't do. This includes that our customer service is always displayed on the website. For example, also providing the packages, the local travel options, uh, payment options, sorry. So basically, in general, being more local, more personal and being more closer. Okay. Okay. Actually, this is slightly overlap. This slightly overlaps with my second question. In terms of post purchase, uh, how do you improve customer? Exp I mean, how do you improve customer experience other than loyalty programs and stuff like that? I mean, how do you measure your efficiency, for example, after per post purchase? Yeah, difficultly. <laughs> I must say. So the one-time conversion is uh, easy. We this year we have the goal to introduce a net promoter score to our customer service team. And I would say this will be the first team that starts measuring the soft part of the booking journey. Because usually we are very focused on conversion points and sessions and so on. So net promoter score will be for the customer service team this year. And uh, well, our data-driven marketing team will be primarily responsible for defining any additional touch points for measuring the complete life cycle. But this is still a very difficult question, even in the online industry, where a lot of things are measurable. But this is just not very well measurable in general. The closest thing is probably a net promoter score. And, um, and then trying to have also user interviews, most likely for qualitative experience, and combine them into a KPI set that gives you an idea, but probably not a single measurement number, as I can currently see. Thank you for your answers, and also thank you for your talk. Bye-bye.